On June 23, 1903, Frederick Winslow Taylor spoke to a room full of people about one of the biggest threats to the American society. Was it about climate change? No. How about massive deforestation? Not quite. Well, then surely it had to be about the eventual disappearance of resources like coal or iron. Well, in fact, it was none of these. Although United States President Theodore Roosevelt had just preached the importance of conserving natural resources, Taylor thought that another threat existed, one that was less visible and intangible. You see, Taylor wasn't speaking to a room full of environmental scientists, politicians, or business owners. He was speaking to a room full of engineers, and he was speaking to them about the topic of national efficiency. Taylor would go on to present that national efficiency was far more significant than any other topic currently being discussed. He argued that the wasted human effort that was largely unnoticed was preventing the country from reaching its optimal level of productivity. In Taylor's book, The Principles of Scientific Management, he would go on to expound upon these ideas and provide ultimately a blueprint, along with supporting evidence, for the implementation of what we know to be scientific management. If scientific management, or task management, could be summarized in one word, it would be efficiency. Taylor believed that every act could be reduced to a science. Taylor claimed that today's workers were not operating at anything close to what he called maximum efficiency, and that wasted effort was rampant among task-oriented work. He presented a few different reasons for this. The first was that men, who were the only gender present in his studies, had certain social incentives to not increase their productivity. Workers would engage in this concept of soldiering, which essentially means that you would work at a deliberately slow pace to avoid the abuse from coworkers who didn't want management to find out that increasing productivity was a possibility. You see, if one worker began to show increased productivity, management may begin to require this level of productivity as the new norm. The other issue was the presence of economic incentives. During this period of time, workers were commonly paid what was known as a fair day's wage. Management would determine this wage by observing what they believe to be a fair day's work, essentially what all employees should be able to produce, and then uniformly pay this wage to all workers regardless of output. So you can probably imagine there wasn't a strong incentive to actually increase productivity, since workers were actually paid the same day's wage regardless. If anything, Workers under this system had an incentive to engage in soldiering so that management wouldn't expect additional productivity for the same day's wage. After all, who really wants to expend additional energy or work longer hours for the same pay? Probably not many, and those that did would succumb to the peer pressure of other workers and reduce their output. Soldiering thus became Taylor's primary concern. If workers were deliberately reducing the pace at which they worked, whether it be due to a natural tendency to take it easy or due to various incentives, how could we create the conditions for them to work at maximum efficiency? Taylor believed that the primary objective of management should be to secure what he called maximum prosperity for both the employer and the employee. He advocated that in order to achieve any type of long-term success, it was necessary for the employer and employees to have a mutually beneficial relationship as opposed to viewing one another as adversaries. In order to accomplish this, Taylor supported that management should assume more of the responsibilities that were actually left for the workers. You see, during this time, workers developed their skills through observing another more seasoned worker and perfecting their trade. As a result, the workers themselves were far more knowledgeable in their work than management. So management allowed workers to determine how best to perform the individual tasks required to complete their assignments. The problem with this is hundreds of different possible ways of performing certain jobs emerged, so there wasn't a consistency between them. Taylor argued that a single and unified set of rules and procedures should be developed that would outline the way that certain tasks should be performed. This determination would be made based upon observing workers to identify inefficiencies and track the amount of time it took for workers to complete certain tasks. Once enough data was collected, management can then establish a clear set of rules to help workers accomplish their tasks in the most efficient manner. Once these rules were created, management then had the responsibility to train and develop workers in accordance with these procedures. Unfortunately, training was lacking under the traditional model of management at this time. The original view 
was that since workers had more skills than management in terms of how to perform the work, they should be the ones to decide how it was to be performed. But Taylor believed that managers didn't need to be the experts to identify preferred methods of operation. By training the workers, management can thus ensure that the tasks are being performed in the most efficient manner. Management could also reassign workers at this stage, as the goal was to allow workers to perform the tasks that they could excel in. The third principle of scientific management was for management to cooperate with workers to ensure the work is being performed consistent with the rules that were previously identified. As mentioned before, this ran contrary to popular opinion of management and workers viewing themselves as adversaries. However, Taylor argued that both parties could achieve their desired outcomes, meaning lower costs for management and higher wages for workers, if they worked in a mutually beneficial way. The last component of scientific management is the equal division of labor between management and workers. Historically, workers were responsible for determining how the work should be performed, but Taylor thought that this was rather unscientific, especially considering the individuals who worked in these types of jobs were, as Taylor put, of low intelligence. Management was in a far better position to determine the optimal method of performing tasks. Furthermore, workers needed to focus on what they did best, actually performing the tasks. So it was inefficient to have them really do anything else. Although Frederick Taylor's scientific management has fallen under criticism for its harsh and maybe even demeaning view of the worker, its focus on inefficiency through division of labor, determining the optimal method of performing tasks, and incentivizing workers to perform a fair day's work is still present today. Taylor's work also created interest in worker productivity and ultimately led to a number of additional studies and subsequent theories. If you really want to see the impact of Taylor's work, just walk into any fast food establishment and you'll surely see some of Taylor's principles at work. Well, that's all for this video. If you're interested in learning more about scientific management, I encourage you to read Frederick Taylor's book, The Principles of Scientific Management. The book has been digitized by Google and you can find a link to it in the video description below. In our next video, we'll discuss the work of French CEO Henri Fayol. For questions, please leave them in the comment box below, and I'll do my best to get back to those in a timely fashion. And remember to subscribe to Alanis Business Academy to have our latest videos sent to you while you sleep. Thanks for watching.